Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the program. Uh, today we're going to talk about late Pleistocene China. We're going to cover this theory about the peopling of China and its, uh, quote, demographic history of the late Pleistocene. Uh, this was an article uh, published in Quaternary. Well, there's two articles that I want to go, go over. Um, this one uh, article that came out in Quaternary and then this other one that, that references that. And um, before I actually go into this, I think um, it's important to to describe what biogeographic realms are or or ecozones. So here's a picture of them, and they're basically the broadest division of Earth's land surface. So you can see there's only a handful of them. Uh, they divided it based on uh, patterns of terrestrial organisms. So in other words, these realms that you see here, all these different colors, um, they delineate large areas of the Earth's surface, obviously, within which organisms evolved in relative isolation over a long period of time. If you just take the model, that, that's the established model of not, not just a gradualism, but just how organisms evolve and interact with each other and stuff, if you have um, geographers, then they're going to stay more or less in the same general area. And that's what these uh, biogeographic realms are basically de delineating. So in this video, we're only going to focus on on uh, Pleistocene China. So that would be this red um, zone, which is the Palearctic. And then the this brown zone, which is either, depending on who you ask, the Indo-Malayan zone or the oriental uh, zone or realm and you guys have probably heard that type of terminology before anyway that the theory is that along with these organisms were people and different types of human beings not just modern uh, humans but er erectus and other other uh, neanderthals and other types of uh, um, hitherto unknown even uh, humans so um though the, the theory is that there there uh were two different populations that came into china in the late pleistocene which is what this article is mainly about um according to this article here china would have received migrations by homo sapiens from both north and south with hardly any overlap between them so the the, the researchers from the sania team they basically are saying that the arrival of modern humans in continental asia was a result of at least two processes and what they mean by two processes i, I from what i gather is the two separate populations. So again, we have the Palearctic zone and then um, the Oriental zone down here. And those are the two different, they had, they all underwent their own genetic history, their own biodiversity, their own evolution. They, they all, they each have their own story. And again, they, they I, I don't think I, I went into this uh, a minute ago, but um, these are all separated by natural barriers, right? So either oceans, high mountains or deserts usually are what uh, separate these things. And the interesting thing to note is Australia here. What's separating this is the Wallace line, essentially, which is, I've talked about it in the past, it's a, it's a very notoriously difficult to navigate um, stretch of, of, of uh, sea that just has really violent currents and, and the waters are just much different um, when, uh, on each side of the Wallace line. So um, that was a natural barrier for a long time and so much so that um, uh, Sahul, I guess, is what you would call this. Um, and what what you see here is obviously not Sahul; it's uh, it's Australia. But back in the day, it was called Sahul, which refers to when it was a a, a giant, an even bigger um, continent, supercontinent, I guess you would call it. And they had their own bio, uh, their own organisms, strictly uh, confined to that area for eons. And um, so that's what they mean by here that they're. Uh, Continental Asia was the result of at least two processes. I mean, modern Asians in continental Asia. So the first took place 80,000 years ago at the latest and consisted of the arrival of the first populations of Homo sapiens on the Asian continent through Arabia, passing through India to Southeast Asia, and finally Australia. So again, that this is all this is theoretical. This is just, I'm just trying to lay this out so you just have a, a, a basic understanding of what they're saying. So what they just described here is, in, in this paragraph here, is just this um, this zone here, the Oriental zone. So this is about circa 80,000 years ago. Now, the, the question is, were they coming or going 
toward Australia, or toward Africa, or were they coming out of Africa? They, they, they're still not sure. Um, if you ask Bruce Fenton, then the answer is obvious from him. They're coming from Australia um, and returning to Africa. Uh, so, again, it depends on who you ask, but it is interesting that they are the more ancient of the two processes that, that, they, that um, the research team um, is discussing here. So the second process is around 45,000 years ago, okay? Populations of Homo sapiens would have arrived from the north through Central Asia, Siberia, and Mongolia. Again, that's here, right? The Paleoarctic, okay? And it's pretty interesting that such a huge landmass is actually a lot younger than, at least in, in terms of, uh, um, as far as Chinese, the Chinese demographics go uh, of, of the late Pleistocene. Obviously, I'm not... Uh, Obviously, I'm not talking about the, the people who are occupying Africa contemporaneous with Pleistocene um, China. But still, it's very interesting that it, it took them almost 35,000 years after people populated um, the Oriental Zone for uh, the second wave of people to come through. Um, and these were the people, of course, who would eventually populate North America and Japan according to um, their theory here. So the green here is uh, a lot younger. It, uh, anyway, that's what they say. Again, I'm, I'm just presenting what, what's printed out. This isn't really my opinion. Um, although I do take it uh, into account. It, there, it seems, there seems to be a growing, uh, some growing data, data surrounding this. Um, but anyway, these, uh, these two uh, populations here are uh, what we're focusing on now. <clears throat> anyway, so um, Maria Torres, or Mar Martinon Torres, she's a director of, of Senia, okay? Um, this is what she says. She says, in addition to this complex scenario, there's also diversity of human populations already inhabiting Asia before we arrived. We, meaning anatomically modern humans. So, um, so this entire area of China here, when these two populations came in or converged together, um, there were already people living there, right? Um, there, there's the, not only the oldest anatomically modern humans, but they found Homo erectus, and I've talked to and Neanderthals, and, and um, it's heavily rumored that there are Denisovans here as well, not to mention the Tibetan Plateau, the Denisovans who are on the pl Tibetan Plateau and developed that uh, altitude gene. Um, but they were already there. So that just adds a whole other dimension to the complexity of, of this entire issue of Again, these these uh, demographic history, the demographic history of late Pleistocene China. Um, so again, um, th in 2015, Senya also published in Nature magazine the discovery of the oldest modern human in China. So this is between 80,000 and 120,000 years ago from the Fuyan site in, in the south of the country. So I think I did an episode on this. Uh, I don't know when, probably a year ago or so. Um, but yeah, they found... Um, and they found a, a a bit of a skull or something like that, um, and it, actually, if you, if you guys are watching this, maybe you should maybe one of you guys can leave a comment and and actually find that article for me um, and post it just for reference. But um, yeah, that's the oldest modern human in China, and of course, they that person would would have be that individual would have belonged to uh, the Indo Malayan group or the uh, Oriental group, whatever you, you want to call it. Um, and so the reason why this guy from the Fuyan site is important is because he existed at a time when Homo sapiens would have been living uh, contemporaneously with Denisovans, Neanderthals, and um, the later Homo erectus, right? Um, if, I, if I just show you guys again, this is Java here, this long island. Um, or this Indo or modern day Indonesia, and so this area here, they found Homo erectus with bigger brain cases than the typical Homo erectus that they found in Africa and, and other and other uh, parts of uh, the world, and so and those were about a hundred and between around this time period, one hundred and twenty to a hundred thousand years ago, around there. So they were there. As we know for sure that they were there. And then who knows what uh, modern-day Philippines and Taiwan 
uh, what other uh, hominids were there that we that we either know of now, like Floresiensis and stuff, or, or Luzonensis, or the other ones that we don't know, right? And I've d in a lot of the videos that I've done in terms, especially with Aus Australasian genetics, as well as uh, people in in Asia as well. Um, there's a lot of DNA sequences, especially within Melanesians, in which they don't even know where the DNA came from. It, they know that it's a hominid X or hominid Y, a mystery hominid, but they, they just don't know. They can't pinpoint exactly, you know, what which hominid it was. But it's not any of the ones that we know of. So again, um, what what is this landscape? What was the world like a hundred thousand years ago? You know, and this is the uh, the article on. Um, on Quaternary International. Um, and I think uh, this is just the abstract, but still some pretty interesting stuff here. Um, the paper proposes a demographic history of China in the last glacial cycle, so late Pleistocene. The history is complex because China lies in both the Paleoarctic and Oriental biographic realms and experienced several immigration events before Homo sapiens, right? So... Um, again, that that's just everything I detailed before the early hominins and and um, Denny Sylvan and such, Erectus, all that stuff. So immigration by our species into the Oriental realm of South China from <clears throat> Southeast Asia probably began as early as eighty thousand years ago. Uh, North China has a different history here. Humans immigrated from Mongolia and southern Siberia forty five thousand years ago um, as part of the cold adapted Paleoarctic fauna. So again, uh, cold adapted, that, that's a huge hallmark of this. And that's why it's called Paleoarctic, right? Because of just how cold it is there. Um, these populations were largely independent of one another. And each needs to be seen as part of the respective biogeographic realms. Uh, and, then this, and then it goes into the Oriental realm as well. In the LGM, North China and Mongolia were largely depopulated. So again, it was largely uninhabitable which may explain why it took them longer uh to to get down and recolonize north china later on so recolonization north, north china happened from both north and the south so i guess as soon as this area opened up northern china right here um the people in the south which you know they were already thriving they moved up as well and then these people in the north moved up and then that that makes a lot of sense right if you look at china now the, even the customs, the customs are different. And I know this is way before the Mongols, way before all that stuff, but still it's very interesting how just the fact that these two populations just came from different biogeographical zones, it, it, it just seeps in culturally all the way to this day. Um, so the researchers suggest in this journal, whoops, um, Explanations of the demographic history of China have to include developments beyond its borders, immigration, assimilation of new populations, and continuity of local groups. So my main question is, I wonder how many wars were fought, or did they even have war? Were they just open and and accepting of each other? I can't imagine that they were. Um, but who knows? There's no evidence of actual warfare back in those days. So maybe they, there was some sort of trade. Maybe there was some sort of harmonious thing going on that united uh, these different species or different offshoots of humans. Um, and uh, perhaps they, maybe not one culture, but maybe some interrelated culture where uh, they didn't see each other as a threat. Maybe they had a different mindset. Like now we have a mindset of scarcity. And maybe back then they had a mindset of abundance where they didn't really hoard or anything like that. Um, maybe greed wasn't as big of a deal as it is now. Um, maybe this is pre-demonic, right? And by demon, I mean stuff like greed, like these vices, uh, greed, lust, you know, the lust for power, whatever it is, um, to see all of these things, um, lying to each other. Maybe all, maybe that's how it's b biblical, right? Maybe, um, I've talked about mind viruses and all that stuff. Um, maybe people in those days weren't as susceptible to that type of stuff. And maybe it took many, many different types of uh, cataclysms for that to come out in people. But anyway, um, I, uh, I thought I would just upload this video before I do the radio show in a couple of days. Um, but please let me know what you think. I thought this is a really interesting article in light of everything that we've been talking about. 
Um, I, I uh, asked Bruce Fenton his his uh, uh, opinion, and he basically says, yeah, this falls in line with what he was uh, uh, talking about, his, um, his theory that pe- uh, people uh, left at Australia instead of Africa. But anyway, uh, like, subscribe, share, please. Um, I really enjoy your support, and I'll see you guys on Friday.